Welcome. I hope everyone is healthy and well and that your loved ones are healthy and well. We've got a really special guest today. I want to get right to her. Um, and I am going to do everything in my power to pull her on right now. This works. Let's see if I have mastered this after the number of days we've tried to do this together. It's a surprise guest. There she is. Um, Hi, ladies Josh. And gentlemen. Hey, Mary Kay. This is Mary Kay Henry. She is the leader of SEIU. Um, and Mary Kay is one of the most extraordinary people I know. Mm. She stands up, works hard for people every day, and makes a huge difference in our government, and our politics. And Mary Kay, thanks for joining us. I'm really excited to have you on the General's Briefing today. Thank you. I'm delighted to join the General's Briefing <laughs> with an incredible Attorney General in Pennsylvania who I'm in good company with as champion for all the people of Pennsylvania. Thank you for your cool. leadership. Oh, uh, thank you so much. So first off, where are you and how are you? Let's start with that. Thank you. I'm uh, staying at home in San Francisco, California, where uh, I was out here to do a pre-convention briefings with our healthcare property service and uh, public service members in California. And uh, when the stay at home order started, I was able to shelter in place in a home with family in San Francisco. Good for you. Well, I'm glad you're safe and glad your loved ones are safe. So let's start out with what is SEIU and what do you do as a union leader? For, for people who are joining us today who just don't know, um, tell us about it. Thank you. I, SEIU in this moment is a union of essential workers on the front lines of this pandemic who are filing uh, unemployment claims and processing them for the millions of people that are out of work due to this pandemic, to the healthcare workers who are trying to deal with slowing the rate of infection and flattening the curve in hospitals, uh, caring for our elders in nursing homes, uh, trying to support elders and people with disability to live with dignity in their homes all across the state of Pennsylvania. And then we have property service uh, workers, janitors who are doing deep cleaning in office buildings and schools right now, and security officers who are still on the job 24 seven, and uh, Workers United factory workers who have converted a uniform factory in Pennsylvania to a factory making masks to wow. supply to the state of Pennsylvania so that people can have the personal protective equipment they need in these times. That's incredible. I wanna talk more about the way in which your members are stepping up during these challenging times. But how many members do you have in SEIU? We have 2 million members in SEIU and millions more fighting for 15 in a union. We are supporting the fast food workers in their demands. And we wanna back every worker, uh, gig workers, uh, support communications workers and transportation workers who are trying to join together and both care for working people in this moment, but also be able to join together to bargain with corporations yeah. uh, to ensure that everybody has an equal shot in this life. Well, I wanna talk about that and the, and the work you're gonna do, particularly as we go forward, God willing, after the, the health crisis is over and deal with the economic crisis. And I, you've yeah. been sounding the alarm bells on a lot of this for a while, but. Um, I want to talk about your members who are on the front lines. You know, I just did a, a, a Zoom with a bunch of high school seniors, and they asked me about leadership during these uh, challenging mm. times. And, you know, what government leaders do you look to? And I said, to be honest with you, most of the leaders I'm looking to right now don't occupy positions of authority within government, but they're the frontline hospital workers and mm. the people cleaning up the rooms after the COVID-19 patient leaves and the, the nurses and, you know, the, the men and women who put on uniforms every day to keep us safe. Um, but one of the things that has upset, upset me so much is even at a time where they are stepping up and leading in these incredible ways, inspiring people, they're doing so without a mask without yeah. PPE, without the necessary equipment. So right. to talk to me a little bit about those struggles. I was talking with Matt Yarnell from, you know, SEIU Healthcare Pennsylvania the other day about some of the home, home healthcare workers who couldn't get masks. So maybe you could talk right. a little bit about those challenges and how you're keeping your members safe and how you deal with the, the mind boggling situation where these are the people keeping our country going and yet they don't have what they need to keep themselves safe. 
Right. You're right. Home care and nursing homes are the major concern of our healthcare locals around the country as hospital workers are getting more access to masks and gowns. And hospitals are now uh, turning to a concern about workforce shortages that will begin to emerge as healthcare workers are infected. Mm -hmm. So the number one concern I think our um, home care and nursing home workers have is what you just said, Josh, which is access to masks and gowns to protect themselves, but also the people they serve. Um, that's a key issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, hospital workers at, at AGH, for instance, where people were dropping off supplies because the community is rallying and people are trying to do everything they can to keep our caregivers safe. Michelle Boyle, who's a trauma RN at AGH in Pittsburgh, told people to start, they will start distributing those extra supplies to nursing home workers and home care workers. Right. So one thing we're doing is joining together and, and without the federal government's leadership, uh, at the state level, I think you and the governor, together with employers and working people, have tried to figure out how to inventory the supply and get it to the most uh, essential needs um, right. in every community. And then the second thing we're doing is we're not letting up on the demand uh, that the federal government do its job. Um, the federal right. government has the power to ask manufacturers to produce the billions of masks that the Health and Human Services Department says we need 2.5 billion masks um, for the course of this pandemic. So the millions that are being procured by individual states mm -hmm. um, need to get um, coordinated on a federal level so we can actually make a national deal with China and not have all these individual state and employer right procurement right. um, happening. And then there's lots of American manufacturers who want to do what Americans do, which is pull together and have each other's backs in this moment. And that should be coordinated at the federal level. In, in the meantime, we are cooperating between states, as we've witnessed, to make sure that the supplies go to where there's the most urgent need. But that's why our union launched a campaign in uh, mid-March to say that we have to protect all workers. And that has to be for their health and safety, but it also has to be for their economic security. Because you know, Josh, some workers have access to paid sick and paid leave, and some don't. And We've had we've seen situation after situation, like a nursing home worker in Hazleton, Andrea Leach. Uh, she's a single mom. Her home care provider for her son who has autism got sick, mm -hmm. and now she's at home caring for her son. And so we have this situation where the most essential workers in the economy are bearing the most stress because they're worried about infecting themselves and their families, and they can't make ends meet and they need pr protective equipment. So you're right to put your finger on, that is a huge source of our concern at this moment. So what are you doing? I, you mentioned AGH, which is you know, a great institution in Pittsburgh. Some may think of it as Highmark, you know, Highmark Allegheny Health. Um, what are you doing in a place like UPMC right now? Are, are, workers, how, are workers there protected? Are they getting, the, the necessary equipment and help they need so they can go out and, and help others. I mean, I, I feel for these, you know, hospital workers on the front lines at a place like UPMC. So tell me a little bit about your efforts yeah, there. And it's, what a, needs it's, to be done. it's a really important contrast at AGH right. because the whole hospital system is unionized. The workers are doing a weekly call with management so they can deal with the most urgent concerns. Okay. Uh, workers join together on PPE, um, they're getting paid sick um, extended. There's relaxed uh, attendance policies at AGH because they know that childcare is now an escalating issue as schools have closed. And at UPMC, uh, there's a total contrast. Um, there was no relaxing of attendance policy. There's no sick time to cover the 14 day quarantine that's required. There, we are trying to get a handle on how um, inconsistent the provision of masks and gowns are and the number of masks that are having to be reused at UPMC. So it's a huge contrast um, between those two employers in terms of how they're meeting this moment for working people. 
Well, I'm, I'm glad you can highlight those differences. I think all of us in the public are so grateful to these hospital workers and the idea that they would have to do this work for all of us without the necessary equipment mm. is, it's just wrong. And so let's yes. keep highlighting that together. And I'm, I'm grateful to you and the, the women and men of SEIU continue to highlight that. It, look, speaking of the women and men of SEIU, one of the things that um, I, I always find just so exciting, frankly, about SEIU is um, you you are, I think, probably, maybe you correct me if I'm wrong, the most diverse union uh, in this country. And if I'm wrong about that, you can correct me, but it feels like you're the most diverse union in the country. And one of the things we have seen is just the, the disparate impact on communities of color. Our black and brown uh, yes. citizens across this country are getting hit by this coronavirus um, in, in such profound ways. It's impacting communities of color not just on the public health side, but the economic side in, in ways yes. that, that are, you know, much more significant than, than white communities and more affluent communities. So maybe you can talk a little bit about how your members are dealing with that, how you're thinking about those issues going forward as we deal with this health crisis. And then from there, I want to talk a little bit about how we rebuild economically, but maybe talk a little bit about the communities of color and how your union is, is trying to do your part to help there. Yeah, the first thing we decided is that we had to make a demand that actually dealt with black, brown, white, Asian Pacific Islander workers, both across race, but mm -hmm. also to um, do as you said, Josh, understand that black and brown and Asian workers are disproportionately concentrated in minimum wage jobs. So right. the, the, and that's not because, um, they aren't capable of doing other jobs. It's because right. the economy and education and all the other systems have structured um, the being forced into that kind of work. Mm -hmm. And so we now that we have this essential worker uh, dynamic, we have primarily black and brown women in nursing homes and home care um, on the front lines um, getting more uh, exposure to infection and then disproportionately um, dying as a result. And so that's why our union is so concerned in COVID-4, making sure that we collect race, age, and income data about who's infected and who's dying, because we need to target resources at the city and state level into those communities right. to help ensure better safety and health and to deal with the economic um, make sure that they have the same access to paid sick, paid comp, uh, full health care. Uh, this is the insanity of McDonald's Corporation giving $26 billion in buybacks to shareholders over the past three years, but lobbying against two weeks of paid sick for a worker that earns $10 an hour. It's just, right. um, especially in this moment, um, McDonald's is actually putting primarily black and brown, but also white workers um, at risk who are doing drive-through food delivery uh, for folks, but don't have PPE, don't have access to cleaning equipment. And it's just an example of the inequality that we have to do a gut check on. And you're shining a light on the thing that we care deeply about, the racial disparity that's been woven in to our healthcare system and into our economic system, that as we respond to the pandemic and as we recover as a nation, we can't reinforce that inequality. We need to intervene on it and change it once and for all. That inequality is something that, you know, we, we battle every day in the Office of Attorney General trying to make sure that the rule of law applies to all, no matter your socioeconomic status, no matter what you look like, who you love, where you come from whatever the, the case may be. And I know that's something your unions fought for. You and I have stood side by side. We've marched together for, you know, for $15 <laughs> an hour and for paid sick leave and things like that. But something tells me that, you know, facing now 1.5 million Pennsylvanians out of work and millions more across this country, that the, the rebuilding process is going to be something that is going to require us all to do that gut check you talk about and think about the type of economy we want to have? Do, do we really want more than 50% of our workforce as, you know, independent contractors working in the gig economy and not having the benefits that you bargain for for your members? Do we really want to have people without a lifeline if they miss a paycheck or someone gets sick in their family or they have to stay home, whatever the case may be? And so I'm just curious, you know, how do you think about 
the rebuilding process. Obviously, we, you know, we got to get these people back up into jobs right away so they can put food on their table for their families. But when you think about the broader economic issues, what do we want that workforce to look like? And how do we affect that change? Well, I was thinking that if we think about the spirit that essential workers are bringing to the uh, danger that they face every day, nurses are pulling extra shifts, nursing home workers are moving in with each other so they don't right. take the infection home to their families. We have janitors pulling extra shifts to make sure that workplaces are clean. Um, that spirit is the spirit that needs to carry into the recovery effort. And I do agree, Josh, we have to make this as a recovery for everybody. And I think we have to think about yeah. not just the 22 million that are un unemployed, but we have to think about the millions more who've had reduced hours and whose jobs were never valued for um, what they contribute to society. If this pandemic has not exposed that the 64 million Americans that earn less than $15 an hour or less than $40,000 a year who are on the front lines of a pandemic don't deserve better than that. Mm -hmm. um, we, I think, as a nation have a chance um, to make happen in a few months what we were have been fighting for decades to change, which is right. I would submit that we have to have as a baseline, we don't want any more poverty wage work in America. So what are we going to do to change the fact that people are stringing together two and three jobs and create an economy where people can work one job and uh, feed themselves and their families? Uh, those are the kinds of things that we think are possible as we come out of this pandemic uh, together and return safely to work. But it's not just going to be returning to the, the normal that existed before, because that normal didn't work for the overwhelming majority mm -hmm. of Americans. We have to create a new normal together that's based on the generosity that essential workers have displayed in the height of this pandemic. So there are going to be some cynics who say, oh, come on, Mary Kay, come on, Josh, you know, the generosity you talk about, that's money coming out of the pockets of the employers. And if we pay people... $15 an hour, if we give them those benefits, if, if we make it so they really don't have to work that second job to put food on their table, you're going to make it impossible for us to make our product or deliver our service. And we're going to employ fewer people as a result, you know, if you two get your way. I hear that argument all the time. How do we respond to that? What, what's your response when someone says, you know, $15 an hour is going to actually stop job growth? Making sure people have benefits is going to limit um, our, our innovation in this country. What, what's your response? Well, in the pre-COVID world, $15 actually generated small business growth because it put more money in the pockets of people that were spending it in their neighborhoods, not shipping it overseas into an offshore bank. That's one. And two, and in a post-COVID world, I would say to employers and to corporations, it's in your economic self-interest and it's in our public health interest to make sure that everybody has the resources they need to care for themselves and their families and keep the curve flat. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't address this economic inequality, we aren't gonna stop the spread of this virus because the economic inequality is putting more people unnecessarily at risk. So I think it's a moment, Josh, where the cynics are gonna have to check themselves because if they care about um, eliminating the virus and stopping the spread, they have to care about an economy that's fairer for everybody. I agree. L let me ask you this as we think about rebuilding the economy in, in, the, in a new way, in a way that we'd like to see where everybody's included. Um, just the other day, uh, my wife and I had ordered some groceries for our family, and they were delivered by a, a wonderful person who had shopped for those groceries and delivered it through one of these online grocery delivery services. And um, I thanked her when she came mm -hmm. and delivered the groceries and, and um, we got into a nice conversation. We were physically distanced, I want you to know. And, but I said, um, are you enjoying <laughs> what, you're, what you're doing? And, and she said, actually, I, I do like it because I have a lot of flexibility. And um, I said, well, what were you doing before? She said, actually, I was a paralegal. Um, I was a law firm. I had salary and benefits and this and that. And while I have more flexibility now, I really don't have that assurance of, of the salary. And I'm worried that the company is going to, uh, you know, 
not give me the tip that that you put through on the app or isn't going to mm. cover me if I get sick and have to miss a couple weeks worth of work. I think about that worker and the transformation a lot of people are making, you know, toward those gig jobs. How do we organize those folks? What is your thoughts on what, you know, what those people ought, what kind of benefits they ought to have and how we ought to think about them as we rebuild the economy after COVID-19? Because I think there's a lot of them and I think those numbers are growing. And I think yeah. for some people, the flexibility is wonderful, right? Uh, yes. But for a lot of people, they don't have that security that, um, you know, that, that they ought to have. So how does SEIU get involved in that process and what does it look like? Well, we've been part of an effort of organizing Uber and Lyft drivers in uh, California. We are supporting efforts of Google workers that have walked off the job um, in various cities around the country and that other unions and organizations are organizing. And I think the first answer I have, Josh, is that we're trying to back the organizing so those workers and that delivery driver can join an organization where they set their priorities. And then what we do as a union is try and think about what innovation can occur at the state level um, mm -hmm. while we're waiting to elect people at the federal level that are willing to join with workers in rewriting the rules so that everybody can uh, join together in a union. Because what we think is that gig workers deserve the same basic uh, benefits that employees have under existing laws. Mm -hmm. But the laws, as you know, have not kept up with the changes in the economy. And so right. we're trying to um, deal with workforce strategies uh, based on laws that were written in the 1930s, and all of our laws need to be updated so that every worker can uh, join together in a union, get a seat at the table, and bargain a better life. I agree with that. Well, you've got a lot of work to do, and I'm grateful to, to be on the front lines with you doing that work. Um, you and, and your team here in Pennsylvania, you know, Gabe and Matt and, and Neil, who's now in D.C., but a Pittsburgher, I mean, just incredible, you know, just incredible work that, that y'all are doing for so many people. And it really has been an honor to have you on the general's briefing today and, um, <laughs> and, and to hear your voice. So I'll tell you what, I, I try to end these things by doing what Mr. Rogers would want us to do, which is to look for the helpers in a time of crisis. And so mm. I always try and highlight a helper. I'm going to give you the last word today and give you the opportunity to highlight a helper who's caught your eye. I know you cited a few in Pennsylvania. It doesn't have to be in Pennsylvania. Any, anywhere you want, tell us who a helper is and who we should be looking to. Well, the one that comes to mind is Andrea Leach, who's a certified nursing assistant at a nursing home in Hazleton. And she has been a huge leader in making the case to her coworkers and to her nursing home administrator about why we need PPE and what it means for every elder that every nursing home worker is caring for. And I think you know, Josh, um, these primarily women, primarily women of color on the front lines of this pandemic mm -hmm. um, care deeply about the people that they serve and in some cases act as the nearest family member, especially now yeah. that a lot of family members can't physically get into the facilities to care for their loved ones. And so for me, Andrea is just an example of the 100,000 uh, nursing assistants across Pennsylvania and the two million in this country um, that are showing up to work every day in spite of the danger to themselves um, because they believe in the mission of what they're doing. That's awesome. Well, we're going to leave it at that. Mary Kay, I am so grateful for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the women and men who, who are on the front lines with you, all the men and women of SEIU. You guys are amazing. Um, I was hoping to see you in the Pittsburgh Labor Day Parade. Hopefully we'll have it. We'll see. Um, and I hope we can get you back for it. It's always great to see you there or see you somewhere. It's a wonderful event. Incredible celebration of the working people of Pennsylvania. Thank you, Joss. Great to be without, with you. Without a doubt. Good to be with you. And everyone, look, you stay safe out there. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.